Uh, now please welcome Professor Christopher Edley, who will introduce our guest for this afternoon. Uh, I haven't done anything. Um, known to his friends as Fritz, Senator Hollings is not an easy politician to, let, to label. When asked by reporters whether he considers himself a liberal or a conservative, Hollings borrows a line from the late Adlai Stevenson, it's not important whether I'm a liberal or a conservative, what matters is whether I'm headed in the right direction. Hollings was born January 1st, 1922 in Charleston, South Carolina. He saw the family business, a comp company which produced brown paper bags for, for grocery stores, go belly up during the Great Depression and work to help his family through difficult times. He attended the Citadel, a military college located in Charleston, and upon graduation in 1942, joined the Army where he served in North Africa and Europe during World War II. Decorated with seven campaign stars and discharged as captain, Hollings entered the University of South Carolina Law School in 1945 and graduated two years later. Hollings served in the South Carolina House of Representatives from 1949 through 1954. From 1951 through 1954, he served as the legislature's speaker pro tem. In 1954, he was elected as one of, the South, uh, one of South Carolina's youngest lieutenant governors, and in 1958, he was elected one of the state's youngest governors. Since 1966, Fritz Hollings has served in the United States Senate, where he currently serves on the Commerce Committee as its ranking Democrat, the Budget Committee, where he is that panel's senior member, and the Appropriations Committee. As governor, Fritz Hollings endorsed John F. Kennedy for president, one of the first Southerners to do so. And at a time when other Southerners were standing in the doorways, Hollings took the responsibility for orderly integration of South Carolina's colleges. He also started a technical education system, providing job training for the jobless and catapulting the state into the age of technology. He also provided the first massive infusion of state funds for public education, to attract better qualified teachers and administrators. Educators' pay rose 38% during Hollings' four years as governor. As a United States Senator, Fritz Hollings authored the Coastal Zone Management Act to protect coastal waters and tidelands. He also sponsored greater protections for wilderness lands, including Ala the Alaska Lands Bill. In 1975, he was named the National Wildlife Federation's Legislator of the Year. Hollings authored the Automobile Fuel Economy Act, putting the mile gallon, mile gallon stickers on new cars and requiring Detroit to build more fuel-efficient cars. And he awakened the conscience of the nation by conducting hunger tours of the rural South in the, in the late 1960s and writing a book, The Case Against Hunger. Finally, he is a leading advocate for a strong national defense. Though he favors beefing up our conventional forces and preserving our technological edge, he has called for mutual arms reductions, a mission-related defense budget, and discontinuing both the B-1 bomber and the MX missile program. It is a pleasure to introduce to you the Honorable Ernest Fritz Hollings. Did your homework. I'm very grateful to Professor Adley. He's done his homework never heard so much about myself. I am grateful, President Atwood, you here at the Law Forum, for an opportunity to uh, appear before you when you even go so far as to say I endorsed President Kennedy. I go back to the days, here yeah, we're going to have Julian Bond follow me, the times that have changed. Well, just a couple of weeks ago, last week really, I could enthusiastically support a holiday for Martin Luther King. I think back to those days of John F. Kennedy. Bobby and I had been two of the ten men of the year in 54, so I actually had campaigned in the Chicago Convention in 56 for Jack Kennedy for vice president. And uh, fortuitously we lost, so we could run in 1960 with a plum, and uh, it wasn't very easy in those days. You ought to hear the prejudices of those particular times. There was a fellow who had gone to Harvard, and it had took. I'll never forget that. Yeah, your candidate, he went to Harvard, and it took. 
Uh, he was wet behind the ears. His father had made his money on Scotch whiskey. And he was a Catholic. And that went on and on. His Catholicism, his religion, is an issue in that particular campaign. In fact, they had all rumors out that uh, I'll never forget one conversation they had down around Jordanville where they were talking to the old country storekeeper Beasley and said, you know, he's going to get elected and uh, he's going to move the Pope and the Pope's going to move right into the White House and they're going to put holy water in the commodes. And he says, what's a commode there, Beasley? He said, I ain't no, I ain't no Catholic. <laughs> <coughs> to speak on the economy or economics, as a Democrat, makes me think of the young man who went to the psychiatrist for an inferiority complex, and you know how those psychiatrists are, you come back and get that weekly treatment, and he'd been doing this for almost a year. Finally, one day, the doctor had a big smile on his face, said, I've got some good news for you. He says, what is that, doc? He says, you really are inferior. Uh, <laughs> This has been the Achilles heel of us Democrats. We've lost three out of the last four elections in that we've always had the high ground, whether it's equal rights, civil rights, health programs, feeding, education, investment in the human infrastructure, foreign policy, and what have you. But when we came around to the managing the economy, we had in 1968 the better man in Hubert Humphrey, but he frightened him on the economy, and we lost. Similarly, in 1972, we had the better man on the economy, but he was going to mail everyone $1,000, and we lost. And then again in 1980, we had President Carter with 12% inflation, 20% interest rates, frightened the American people on the economy, and we elected the movie star as President of the United States. And so it is that, again, we are apparently determined to run once more the 1980 race. My good friend, Vice President Mondale, is approaching it in the same fashion. There's not a problem or problem group in the country or individual interest that he doesn't have a money solution for that particular problem. Don't worry, he says. I I promise you this, I promise you that. And of course, the American people are not stupid. They realize that with these commitments to all the individual groups, there's no chance of bringing $200 billion deficit down into the realm of uh, the realistic. And our friend Senator Glenn is orbiting the issues faster than he can orbit the earth. I know that he was the strongest supporter for President Carter, but now today he thinks Carterism was a disaster. He was uh, for the tax cut for the rich in Reaganomics. Now he's against Reaganomics and against the tax cut for the rich. He was uh, against Salt II, and then he was for Salt II. He was for Social Security being turned to a voluntary program and now opposed to that particular one. He would not retaliate if we dropped a bomb, the Soviet did, on Nevada, and now he says he would retaliate. And right on down the line to conventional readiness. He would strengthen our conventional forces, but he is opposed to the rapid deployment force. So uh, Senator Glenn is the only centrist I know without a center, and we can't wait around and try to beat President Reagan on that particular score. And Reaganomics must be beat. There is no question that uh, it's working, but differently than what the President himself now assumes it to be, namely a success. Let's go right down the list with respect to the aims and goals of Reaganomics and the actual results. I'll never forget we were going to have the, what they call the psychology of anticipation. Immediately upon the enactment of Reaganomics, there would be a burst in the economy. And immediately upon the enactment, 
Signed into law in August of 1981, by September we were on a decline and started the deepest recession depression that we've experienced since World War II. Again, that Reaganomics was supposed to engender revenues. We were going to increase our defense budget. It was a, some kind of economic quackery, if you remember. We were going to take the increased revenues from our decreased taxes and increased defense. And with all of these added revenues, we'd balance the budget by 1984. We're running now $200 billion deficits and $200 billion deficits in the foreseeable future. Certain it was that business, there was no question that President Reagan was a friend of the economy, friend of business, and we'd have increased business investment. We've had now the one singular two-year cycle of negative business investment for the past two years. The fact is the Department of Commerce estimates a minus 3.1 percent for this year, and if you look at new plant and facilities where they were really supposed to steam up America's competitive edge, increase its productivity, it's a minus 9.2 percent. Reaganomics would certainly encourage savings. Savings are again at a low time all-time low of 4% since World War II. And again, Reaganomics was to have a decrease in the cost of money, the real interest rates would fall. I think I just said we had 12% inflation and 20% interest rates on the President Carter when he left office, or a real cost of money of 8%. Now we have an inflation rate of 3.4%, and the cost of money at 13 and a half. So it's about a 10%, 10.1% cost in interest. So they have, that's also increased. And finally, we were to have with this increase in productivity and competitiveness within America itself and a decrease in the deficit and the balance of trade. We were supposed to increase our trade level. We now, some estimate as much as 100 billion I would accept the figure of a $70 billion deficit in the balance of trade. The fact is that Business Week says we've lost, as a result of the drop in exports, some 1.5 million jobs. So you can see that aside from us in the political field who come in and tell you about Main Street bankruptcies and the various other things that uh, would occur, that uh, more than anything else, Reaganomics is working, but still working to the adversity of the American economy. In trying to lay out an industrial policy, perhaps it's well to state what it's not, in my opinion, or should not be. And that is in contradistinction to the many that have been presented, because we go through all of these particular litanies in Washington, we learn reindustrialization. I remember back in 1978, in fact, for small business, I'm confident some would ask, well, what are we going to do for small business? Uh, you think it up and we'll do it. Uh, we had Gaylord Nelson, the senator from Wisconsin, one of my best friends. And Gaylord was the chairman of the Small Business Administration Committee in the United States Senate, and uh, we were going to re-elect Gaylord. We thought with the reindustrialization, where we'd reduce the capital gains from 48 to 28 percent to reindustrialize America, that would take care of big business. And what about the small businessman? So we put in 14 different things to uh, take care of small business and reindustrialize America. Well, Gaylord didn't get re-elected, and we not reindustrialized. So this is not anything new here five years later. And what it is not, it is not a money program. It doesn't involve money, my particular industrial policy. Everyone came running at the time, a couple of years ago, when the think tank boys and all were writing about industrial policy and getting business and labor and government around the table and what have you. All the different books and treatises all had some kind of money source. And uh, let me go right to that particular one so you'll understand it. 
In Stanford, Connecticut, around the table with the high-tech industries, I've also been chairman of the communications subcommittee. And I went up on the end of last year with my high-tech talk. And uh, I started right in on high-tech, and they said, Senator Coolidge, you had the head of GE and General Telephone and Electronics and uh, Singer and Moore McCormick, Bangapuda. You had them all around the table there, and they said, Senator Coolidge, high-tech has all the money it needs. You see, they said they were buried at bar. What had really occurred is last summer, all of these Latin American loans as well as third world loans went up ended just about, and uh, the bank stopped immediately cutting off, and they immediately had a tremendous amount of money. So now there's no shortage of capital out there, and America's industry, high-tech and otherwise, low-tech, basic industry, what have you, is ready, willing, and able to borrow that at 9 or 10 percent. Blue-chip corporations of America can do that, but they're very, very much afraid that by 1985, with these high deficits, we'll be back to 18% rather than 9 or 10. We'll be back to 18 or 20% again. And so that's quite a difference. You can make your capitalization at a 10% level and make a 25% return on it. But to try to borrow at 20%, you must receive at least 40 percent, and that makes it real tough, and it's easier to buy money market certificates or another company off the stock exchange. So my plan does not involve money because money is not needed. There's no need for an RFC plan, and there's no need to get off onto this high-tech business because the inference is of high-tech <coughs> is like they told England when she withdrew from the colonies after World War II. She used to take the raw materials from the uh, colonies and manufacture the finished products. And as the end of the war, they started withdrawing. They told England, now don't worry, you'll be a nation of brains rather than brawn. And instead of really uh, hand, uh, uh, producing wealth, you'll handle it. You'll be a financial center. Instead of uh, producing products, you'll provide services and you'll be a service economy. And this mentality, tells us in Washington that don't worry, sit back, relax, we're just developing and changing around into a service economy. And of course, England continues to go to hell in an economic handbasket, and if anybody looks at it closely, that's a sort of smug attitude of let the lesser develop the third world take care of textiles and shoes, and we are sophisticated, and we'll take care of the high tech. And now they've learned that Atari has left Massachusetts and move to Taiwan and Hong Kong. High tech does not mean high skill. I know better than anyone else. I'm a southern governor. I can show you the high tech industries that I have in my state, and nor does it mean retrain America. You hear all these money programs that we need in RFC and we need to go high tech or retrain America, retrain. Well, everybody's for upgrading their knowledge, all their skills. But the fact of the matter is, there's no national need of training programs. You give me the job opportunity, I will train. I did. Minster of Ohio, I took 100 rural farm workers and in 100 days provide skilled laborers for Minster of Ohio to make robots. And if I can do that in South Carolina, you can do it anywhere. In fact, I went up at that particular time, Abe Ribicoff was governor of Connecticut, Mike DeSalle was governor of Ohio. I copied the better elements from Ohio and Connecticut, and all of our competitive states have outstanding technical skills, technical training programs, so it's no national need as some of these politicians come and state as we've got to retrain America, high-tech, high-tech, winners and losers like we're going to get a governmental board around the table and decide who the winners are and who the losers. That frightens anyone with common sense in America. There's no political body that can decide that. The economy has been deciding that. That's the fundamental of our capitalistic society. What is it then? First, it's getting those deficits down. As that Stanford, Connecticut crowd told me around that table, they said, Senator, if you bring those deficits down, we can't expect that you balance the budget next year. That would be unrealistic. But if you can get us on a glide path, the government back into the black, 
Therein, then we'll know we're not getting caught out in 85 or 86 with 20% interest rates. We are lean. We are hungry. We have closed down marginal operations in this particular recession. We've fired a lot of people, and we're ready to compete, and we're ready to come back into the game. And the only thing holding us back is your fiscal policy there in Washington with these interminable $200 billion deficits. So the first order of business is to bring the deficit down, and as a person of 30 years' experience on every budget level, from the local to the state to the national level, I can tell you categorically that can only be done through a shared sacrifice where everything gives. I go to these meetings and they constantly say, well, we ought to cut a little on the fence. No, no, we've got to increase it. No, no, we've got to do it on social programs. And it's like a dog chasing his tail and a run around and everybody said, well, that was a good meeting and get out and nothing happens. <laughs> We veritably worn out and understand better than any, say as a governor, I couldn't print dollars in the capital city of Columbia, South Carolina. There wasn't any elbow room or volition or wise way to do it. It was the only way to do it was to take this year's budget and write it into law for next year. If you did that with the federal budget, this particular year's budget, 1983, and put it into law for 1984, you'd pick up 100 billion bucks. You'd save, and what I think in a freeze program, we'd have to reinstate the July 10% tax cut of $33 billion. You'd save another $30 billion. On defense, that's $63 billion right there. I could go right down if you want to break it down. But there's no question. But what we really need then is a freeze of spending increases across the board, social programs, entitlement programs, defense spending, and tax spending, all of them. Now, if President Reagan were to come on at 8 o'clock tonight on national TV and say, look, the ox is in the ditch, we're in trouble, I like my Reaganomics program, we see good signs of its working, but I've met with the world leaders, and the free world economies are now worried that the turnaround is not going to be complete, and the only way we can assure that is to make certain that we hold back on these deficits and we're going to do just like you do in City Hall or in the state capital America. We're not going to cut the programs. We're not going to increase the programs. We'll just hold them levelly funded right across the board and set that particular pace and then a 3% real growth for national defense and for the social programs and even entitlements for the next three years thereafter. We'll really pick you up $700 billion over that four-year period, and by 1988, you'd be right at that level almost of a balanced budget. Now, this is a shared sacrifice, and this is plank one in any industrial policy, is to get the government deficits out of the way so the economy can operate. You know, we beat each other up around the nation's capital, constantly putting in jobs bills. We did that all through the 70s. We tried to spend us into prosperity. Of course, the Republicans now try to tax cut us into prosperity. But I can remember us Democrats, we had counter-cyclical public works, CETA. If you had any kind of things that had jobs, we bought them. We put money to it, and we bought every kind of job you could think of and ran up the most awful deficits you've ever seen and ran ourselves all out of office by 1980 with that inflationary approach. And so it is that you look at every one of these four to five billion dollar jobs bill, that picks up a couple of hundred thousand jobs at best, and they're only temporary. If you really want to put the three million Americans back to work that lost their jobs as a, uh, as a result of Reaganomics, bring those deficits down, start them on a glide path, back of government into the black, and we can immediately, that's the best jobs bill, that's the best industrial policy, that's the play, way to put America back to work. Secondly, in an industrial policy, <coughs> you would learn, as I did, as a governor trying to attract industry to the Southland, and every chairman of the board, a president in that executive office in New York would look at me and say, look, governor, we're gladly coming down to that particular town, but we really are not going to do that unless we can get it there, up, built, operative, and in the black. And we cannot get this new facility operative and in the black 
unless we bring along top flight supervisory personnel. And the top flight supervisory personnel are not going to follow us down to Podunk, South Carolina, unless you have a good, strong public educational program. They want the best of education, an opportunity for their particular children, and we need to build on the skills, and that's the great weakness that you have in the South, is education. So I learned 20-some years ago that we were not going to increase the economic level of any unless we increase the educational level of all. And so you'll find Terry Sanford of North Carolina, myself, Dale Bumpers, Reuben Askew, all the other governors who've come along and really have industrial developmental programs putting that number one emphasis on education itself. But let's look at the other side of the ledger if you have any doubts about the efficacy of rebuilding America's education. You know, it was Savannah Shriver who wrote back in the 50s in the American Challenge that the great difference and reason for success of America was its universal public education system. Japan, our competitor, knew that, studied it, and looked at it. You'll go to the classes in economics, and they'll lecture you about the natural resources and each country, whether you have iron resources or water resources or energy resources, <clears throat> each country is supposed to manufacture and compete on the basis of its natural resources. That's its comparative advantage, they call that in Economics 101. The truth of it is that it's right up here. It's for brain power. Japan doesn't have any of those natural resources, but they went after a very, very strong public education program. And so it was last year that the New York Stock Exchange had completed its year-long study of Japan trying to answer the one question, why the high productivity in Japan? And the answer was elementary and secondary education. It's issued last November, a year ago. I'm listening now to the Carnegie, the Commission on Excellence, the Governor Hunt Commission, uh, every commission is coming around. We'll have 20-some reports this year, 1983, on education in America. The best one I've seen. And I've re I'll read them all as they come along. And they're all good. They all have very valid recommendations and what have you. But the best of all is the New York Stock Exchange on productivity in Japan. And what we really need to be doing is professionalize teaching. Teaching is not a profession in America. I know all the other things about the discipline and longer hours and longer school year and more for math and science and more for English and this and <coughs> better discipline, like I said, more money, merit pay for teachers. But the fact is that all of these particular reports have a single thread, the need for a better teacher, and a single flaw, the failure to provide for one. And you're talking in macroeconomic terms of about 14 billion bucks. And therein is a hang-up because people don't want to approach the problem as a national problem and in a realistic fashion. But teachers are just hired hands. They don't have any of the rights. They don't have any of the privileges. They don't have any of the responsibilities. They don't select their clients, their hours, the curriculum. They don't have anything to do with the pay, certainly nothing to do with the standards of their particular profession. And this has come about through a hundred years of women not being liberated. Now, this classroom teacher, the women now, prior to that time, for nine months, that's all the only job those with uh, women with talent could uh, obtain. But there's no question now that for the past 10 years, women have been liberated. The economics now have forced them out of the classroom. You look at, I just was talking in Texas, the classroom teacher of 10 years receives less than the beginning guard at the penitentiary. The District of Columbia, the clerk in the liquor store, is paid more than the teacher. I can give you example upon example upon example. But they're grossly underpaid. And the issue is not merit pay, but base pay. But before you can really put that money to it, you must set some standards of professional levels. And what we need is a teacher commission in each of the several states to set the standards. And once found professionally competent, we should be supplementing that pay at least $5,000 generally, and within the <coughs> inner cities of America, at least $10,000.
Now, therein is a good industrial policy for America. The third thing in the way of uh, competition and industrial policy is to confront the realities of foreign trade. And this is, this is you'll be arguing this one the rest of your lives because there's a sort of mentality about protectionism. I don't know why it's taken on a pejorative sense. We have the army to protect us from the enemies without, the FBI to protect us from the enemies within. We have the unemployment compensation from the loss of a job, Social Security, to protect you from the ravages of old age, the air we breathe, the water we drink, environmental standards and laws to protect us. But when it comes to national, international trade, somehow, ooh, that's protectionism, and then everybody's mentality goes down, smoot holy and a bunch of sorry history that they don't understand and appreciate. And we're up in the grandstand caterwauling free trade and protectionism, and everyone else is engaged in a trade war. We have the most magnificent dynamic trade war going on you've ever seen. Every weapon is being used. And I'm putting this in this sort of sense of the extreme so it'll get fixed in your mind. And I'm not anti-Japanese. I've got Akio Morita and Sony, who's now locating in Columbia, South Carolina. I have 13 other Japanese plants, and we're not sending them to Japan to learn how to sing company songs. We have the most productive workers in all of America. Don't let them sell you that nonsense. We can outproduce any Japanese worker at any particular time in your and my country. But the fact is that the Japanese and West Europeans took the Marshall Plan and they learned from us how to produce and then went one step further. They injected their governments as an element of the international competition. And so you'll find that uh, there's a government full employment policy that dumps steel at less than cost from the United Kingdom. Don't tell me about a modern steel plant. I'll take you. The one built by Willie Koch in the German steel entities in Georgetown, South Carolina, right down the road from my hometown, but they're dumping on my hometown docks as a matter of full employment in the United Kingdom steel at less than cost. So U.S. Steel says, look, we're not pro bono publico. We, we'll just, uh, we like to make steel. We've been making it for 138 years, but we'll just buy marathon oil. Then there is government procurement policies that you're all familiar with. You don't fly on a plane in France unless it's made in France. You have government subsidies. When I walk into the Ford Motor Company in Detroit, I look and see the robot mean Japanese make. I'm saying, I know Giddings and Lewis, Cincinnati, Millicron, and the others make a better robot, and I find out, well, it's Japanese because the Japanese subsidize it. And I see the uh, licensing practices, government inspection practices. You can go right on down, government monetary policy, government fiscal policy. It's not private free enterprise in the international or global economy. It is government to government enterprise. And we need our government in a measured way to just not pass a whole bunch of new laws, but enforce what we have. I could go into the customs practices, Section 808. We can go into the trigger price mechanism. We can go into the Zenith case, where they went all the way through, won the case to the United States Supreme Court, and the government came from behind and settled it 10 cents on a dollar. So at the present time, each one of these administrations with the State Department tail wagging the dog of the executive branch coming in and more or less saying free trade, free trade protectionism, we are non-competitors, non-participants in this dynamic of a global economy. And what we need is our government to come in and intervene, if you please, to stop the intervention of the Japanese into our domestic market. If we can't do that, then we don't have a government. It's as simple as that. We need, like Franklin Roosevelt in the Depression days, in order to keep the banks open, he closed the doors. In order to save the crops, he farms, he plowed under the crops. In order to remove a barrier, we might have to raise a barrier and then remove them both. But it is reciprocal free trade, Cordell Hull said, and we haven't been reciprocating. We need to certainly go forward with our export trading company we need to move forward with our, what we call, world information 
in trade service, which program that we instituted in the Department of Commerce, we need to bolster exports. There's no question about that. There are many ways that we can do it. But fourthly, we really need to institute a National Science Foundation in a way for business. Of course, they've cut the National Science Foundation a billion bucks. We're trying to reinstate that Reagan cut. But more than anything else, if you talk to a gentleman, Phil Pletznik, who was the Secretary of Commerce, he was beginning, and we were moving together, to put in to the Department of Commerce an applied research section taking the billions and billions and billions of dollars of federal defense research endeavor and take it and turn it over to private industry. There's no entity in our government. We have over 600 laboratories, bureau standards and otherwise, working all the way around the world, but we have no real feed in to the private business sector, somewhat like we developed synthetic rubber during World War II and then turned it over to private industry. We have more research backed up in the pipeline than you and I as taxpayers have paid for just sitting there. And the Japanese come along and finally, like the robot, which is a U.S. Uh, research development, they come along and develop it. We need to change some of our laws with respect to antitrust to allow competition in the international economy, the Glass-Steagall Act. But more than anything else, finally, I'm going to try to answer your question and save time there, is to change the attitude of the government itself with respect to business and somehow not a government plan, but the attitude towards government to business and labor itself to eliminate the adversary relationship that is too expensive for us in this modern day world in which we live. And this depends on the particular individual and leader and how he handles it. I know as a former governor, I was working with labor and business community leaders, educational leaders, I never had a law. I didn't have a board. We did have a development board. We had technical training. We had a business development uh, corporation for the financing and things of that kind. But it's just the attitude and approach, specifically in the matter of foreign trade with our State Department. I would never want an ambassador who would not be willing to work with the American business community in trying to develop their overseas products and markets. And that has not been done at any particular time. I can give you numerous examples, but time doesn't permit. What really needs to be done is realize that the question is not, are you better off than what you were four years ago, but are we as a nation better off? The distinction is very important. Too often we've been appealing to the individual interests at the expense of the common good, overlooking if you please, the true strength of America. And that's the strength of our unity of purpose. This is what we really need, is someone to reach out and give us that sense of purpose again. And I would hope under that new leadership that we could work together, that we could compete together, and that we could redeem once again the promise of America with an industrial policy it didn't call for a lot of money, not really a lot of new ideas. I love new ideas. That's the learning process serving in the National Congress. It's the best I know. But what we really need is some rededication to old ideals of paying our bills and doing what government can do best. And that is strengthen the economy, edu educate our youth, and use the government to level that playing field of international competition so that our industry can have a fair chance for free trade. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your attention. Be glad to try to answer any questions that you have. The, uh, the way we'll run the question and answer period, we have two microphones here, uh, and if you could assemble behind them, we'll just alternate. Thank you. We got to we got a good half hour. Okay. I'd just like to point out that uh, your comments on education are misleading because while Japan does, in fact, graduate twice as many engineers as we do, we graduate 100 times more lawyers than Japan does. The trouble is that lawyers don't really contribute to industrial production 
and spending money on an education system as, in fact, the National Defense Act of 1958 did doesn't help the in industry unless the money doesn't go into law but goes into industry. But what I really wanted to comment on, I don't know if you ever see the consolidated financial statements of the United States government. This, I just got today the latest issue. And uh, you seem preoccupied with the $200 billion deficit. But in fact, you must be aware that we have a $10 trillion unfunded liability in this country, which shows up in, the, uh, in this kind of a financial statement. And this uh, accumulated position of the United States government has been getting worse at the rate of about a trillion dollars a year until this year. And under Reagan, for the first time, the accumulated deficit has been reduced by $800 billion. I wonder if you don't feel that this accumulated uh, negative position of one of $10 trillion isn't a far bigger problem than the $200 billion fiscal deficit. And if you don't feel it's bad, what is going to happen to that Who's going to pay for that $10 trillion eventually? You and me, eventually. The, uh, the answer to that is Not the people who leave the country. You mean that we are going to be stuck and the people who manage the profit and <laughs> escape accountability are going to benefit? Don't you think we're going to have a lot of people uh, leaving the country <laughs> <laughs> to evade their responsibility? Well, well, historically, that happens. Good riddance to them. Let them go. <laughs> <laughs> we... we yeah. We, we and, and will oh, end up paying them. Most respectfully, number one, I didn't mislead. I accurately reported the New York Stock Exchange study, and I believe that study. And if you look at it, it's quite a comprehensive report. And yes, we do have far more lawyers, but they're talking. They didn't get into how many lawyers we had. They got into the productivity and the general level and educable nature of our, and of our society is dependent upon its competitiveness, let's say, in the next generation, by the year 2000, will those leaders then coming on be as well prepared as the leaders of the other several nations? We always, as a result of universal public education, were ahead of France, Germany, Japan, and all the rest. And I think we've fallen dangerously behind. Now, jumping right to that particular report about the unfunded liability, I can tell you categorically, I have been, like I say, in government finance, and I sat on the back row of a Ways and Means Committee in the state legislature in 1948 and 49. I've worked with the Federation of Tax Administrators. I've written the sales tax law. I can say that publicly now. They shot the fellow that did it for Florida. And uh, I have worked uh, all the way up, not only through the Appropriations Committee, but with the budget, the budget process, and been chairman of the Budget Committee. I know about that report. That is not the first time I've ever heard of that, that every report. Year. But I can tell you this here and now. It must be put out by the CIA because you're the first fellow in 30-some years has ever mentioned that to me. It's put no out by the Bureau of Government Financial budget. Operations Department of the Treasury. I know that. I'm not doubting the accuracy. You asked me whether that had an effect. I'm saying none whatsoever. I hadn't heard of it in 30-some years of public service. And I have visited. You can go to all the financial centers in, in different groups. I've met uh, with uh, Alan Greenspan, Walter Heller, Otto Eckstein, Larry Klein, and Walton. We can go right on down, Paul McCracken, and all the rest. You have a, uh, an item there that no one's worried about right now. We but, don't have time to worry about that. We've got to worry first about the $200 billion deficits. Maybe that's the problem. Nobody's worried about this. Maybe, well, product maybe why don't productivity you, is so bad. Good. Then you open the eyes on that one. Uh, thank you. Let me just uh, yeah. reiterate that the question should be short and brief, and also uh, the senator is here to answer questions, not to be lectured to. Thank you. Uh, um, senator, uh, this doesn't relate directly to your talk, perhaps, but it does relate to the economies of poorer people. When you were senator, I think, or just before you became senator, you said that when you were governor, you swept the problem of hunger under the rug in South Carolina and did not address that. My question, I guess, is twofold. Number one, why couldn't you address it more fully as governor and why didn't you? And number two, if you want to freeze the budget, including social services, how would that help attack the problem of hunger in this country? It seems to me it would hinder it somewhat if you froze the budget. No, uh, let's take, well, the first one, you're dead right, and I wrote that in the book that we swept it as a young, competitive, eager governor in the South. Uh, 
Luther Hodges of North Carolina, and I had been lieutenant governors. Luther Hodges as governor. Umstead died. Mine did too, but he wouldn't lay down. And uh, Luther got in there two years. Experience in will travel, and I was headed north, and I was looking for industrial and job opportunity and did not direct the attention of our state government and the governor's office to the problem of hunger. And later we learned of the extensive nature and how it impacted upon the productivity and the ability of the citizens to prepare, prepare themselves to work in the factories, produce, and be useful citizens. Now, with respect to a freeze, you must understand the particular forum in which we're in. This is a Reagan forum. Too many of my Democratic friends still think they're in office and they're in control. We, each year, are facing the onslaught of spending cuts for women's infants and children's feeding, for lunchroom programs, for student loans, and all the rest of those particular investments in the human infrastructure. When I freeze, I've saved myself from a cut. The community action groups, those supporting women's infants and children's feeding, and all the other particular Head Start programs heartily support me in Washington on my freeze because they know they won't be cut. Now, let's start there with that freeze. I can show you how we make money on these social programs. And I could go into the feeding programs, but I don't want to uh, be too long in my answer. I'm trying to be as direct as I can. But don't worry about a freeze of social programs hurting the social programs under the Reagan administration and proposals for some $35 billion in cuts. We are saving legal services. I can go right on down the litany to several billions and billions of dollars in saving those social programs. When we do freeze, what we really get at is the inordinate increases in defense and tax cuts, tax spending. Well, why is governor, couldn't you address the problem more directly of hunger during your years as governor? I didn't do it. I told you what I paid attention to. I couldn't have been a very negligent governor. I was overwhelmingly elected senator and been elected senator four times. In fact, all the other governors were around and never did anything about it. But I did when I learned of it and understood it. And in fact, in order to sell it to the Rotary Club and the Chamber of Commerce, that's why I got into writing a book about it, working with the various uh, experts in feeding. Uh, let me go into it so you'll understand, because my friend doesn't seem to be satisfied uh, when you talk about cuts and in investments in the human infrastructure. You've got 13 billion brain cells, and I have 13 billion brain cells. And 10 of the 13 billion to develop the first five months in the mother's womb, and there's as much as 20% less cellular development due to a lack of protein, the synthesis of the nerve cells, like taking a TV set off the rostrum, dropping it on the floor, putting it back up there, switching it on, the thousands of wires of circuitry don't come together. Herein, the billions of nerve cells don't join. The infant comes into this world, is not educable, cannot concentrate. It's taken, put into the first grade. Then as a social promotion into the second grade, too big, distraught, disoriented. Before long, it's back down into the ghetto, and then into mischief, and then into crime. And I learned long ago now that it's cheaper to feed that child than it is to jail that man because as a governor, I paid to run penitentiaries, $50 a day per inmate. And uh, when our friend Stockman comes and he's going to save money, this WIC program now has gone up from $120 million to almost a billion bucks. We're going to cut it $500 million. He's not saving $500 million dollars. He's actually increasing other attendant governmental cost and rehabilitation, health care, and what have you, some five billion. And these are the things that we must learn in government. The fact that I learned it late is to be regretted, but the fact that I learned it at all is, is I'm thankful for. Yes. It seems to me that by advocating a budget freeze, that you're taking even by your own admission, a very defensive position. And it seems to me that that's also from the perspective of a legislator in the minority party of the Senate and not necessarily an agenda-setting president. And I agree with you that it's very important not to have our social programs cut, 
by, by advocate, advocating a freeze, what you are in effect doing is ratifying President Reagan's ideas about what is a proper level of spending for these various programs, which you may disagree with philosophically, and secondly, along with this, is if you advocate increasing education spending or, more specifically, instituting a higher pay for teachers, how can you do that without cutting defense or whatever? In other words, the two ideas seem very inconsistent with freezing the general budget and then raising the expenditure for the other. Let me take the first allusion to a minority recommendation. The truth is that's a minority and a majority recommendation. Year, uh, last year, we were able, for the first time in the record books, to have Ronald Reagan and Speaker Tip O'Neill agree. Howard Baker had come to me and he says, we just must stop somewhere. And unless we take a proposal of yours and generally work it out, he wasn't committed to just that particular proposal, but he said, if you will submit it, I'll be on the Senate floor, commend it to the attention of everyone. Bob Dole will be there. You can have others from the Budget Committee, which I did. And uh, that was all arranged, and uh, to our surprise and interest, uh, President Reagan appeared in Indianapolis the night before, and he then had gotten really confident about his program. He said, if you don't like my particular program, uh, let's have an alternative, put up or shut up. So the next morning when I put up my program, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill both said, shut up. <laughs> they agreed on me. Those who wanted more spending for this and those who wanted more spending for that, either social or defense. There is a tremendous bipartisan feel, and I had a bipartisan vote on it again this year. And it's beginning to develop. Uh, as a minority or as a Democrat, number one, the budgets that have passed the Congress have been by a Democratic Congress. There's no budget on any particular program, education or otherwise, that has not gotten through at the level of the overwhelmingly Democratic House of Representatives. So you assuming that Ronald Reagan had all his programs, he's wanted far more cuts, and we've hailed student loans and various other things. So number one, we're not taking the Reagan program and putting it into law, we're taking the one we passed last December, which an overwhelming number of Democrats voted for and almost force-fed, it was almost Christmas time. Ronald Reagan had threatened to veto it about five times. That was the only way to keep the government going under continuing resolution. Now, with respect to, uh, oh, where do you get the money? Very easy. If you look at the defense budget, and I would immediately freeze defense, I picked up 30 to 40 billion bucks. Specifically, with an M1, I mean, uh, MX, that costs you $30 billion over a period of of several years and the B1, uh, $40 billion, I can easily pick up that $70 billion with a freeze and reallocate that from defense over the public education. I've never tried to mislead the teachers of America politically saying, oh, I'm going to freeze my budget and I'll also go give you extra money. I said if they didn't ever want to go along, they've been underpaid for 100 years, they can be underpaid for another 101 years and they'll survive. But the truth is that if we're willing to spend $30 billion for an Amex and $40 billion for a B-1, I think the school children of America are worth at least one weapon system. And I'd reallocate those billions over into education, just one half of one of those particular programs, and within the freeze and within the budget. Yes, sir. Um, Senator, I think the proposition that uh, current levels of federal deficits have to be brought under control has received widespread support among professional economists, uh, politicians, and world leaders outside Washington, perhaps. Um, but do you support a constitutional amendment to require a federally balanced budget? I've stated right candidly that I'd vote for it just to stop the argument, but stayed in the same breath that it wouldn't solve the problem. I come from a state that had within its constitution of 1895, Article 10, Section 2, thou budget shall be balanced, all expenditures being in within the expected revenues. Until I came to office, that was observed more in the breach. It didn't control any budget. A constitutional provision is, is much like a speedometer on the economic engine. It can tell you when you're speeding, but it's not a governor in and of itself. It won't control you from speeding. And so rather than get into the litany about the constitutional amendment, who are you going to lock up? Uh, put it into the Constitution. 
President Reagan and the Congress, both very sincere, both very intent, very genuine. President Reagan could estimate next year 8.5% uh, unemployment. We could estimate 9.5% unemployment. We could both be right or wrong, but there's a $25 billion difference there. With respect to 1% of the growth, he could estimate a 5% growth. We could estimate a 4% growth. There's another $25 billion there. That's $50 billion difference. So who's going to be really chastised, locked up, or how is the provision going to be enforced? And people should not be misled. The way to really bring about fiscal responsibility and strong economy is within the congressional branch, the legislative branch of government or the congressional branch, and that cannot be done. We have found leaders on both sides of the aisle unless the president takes that position, unless he sets that discipline. He comes this year, and he starts off the exact opposite. He says, don't listen to this talk about deficits. My spending in defense is not costing any, causing any deficits. I want my $40 billion more. Don't listen to this thing about tax cuts. Cost. I want my $33 billion tax cut. So the average senator looks at me and he said, Fritz, I'm willing to go along with the president. He's already said he's going to veto anything that affects his tax cut or his defense spending. And I don't want to be postured as anti-tax cut or postured as anti-defense. And incidentally, since he's gotten his $70 billion, I just want just $500 million more on student loans. So there, you know, 535 of us running around for our particular programs because the president's already copied off the major amount. So there is no discipline. That's what really occurs. Yes, sir. If I remember right, during the Senate debate and the amendment to permit prayer in schools, when Senator Metzenbaum got up to speak, you said something like, here comes the senator from B'nai B'rith. And I was wondering how uh, you would reconcile that co comment with your earlier comments today about the need for national unity. Well, that didn't bring any disunity. You ought to see Howard and me yesterday. We had lunch together. Uh, right to that particular point, we were debating prayer in schools. Senator Danforth, who is an Episcopal priest as well as a former state attorney general, was uh, cross-examining in a way on the floor of the Senate, the senator from North Carolina. The senator from North Carolina had been referred to as a Baptist senator. The senator from Missouri, Senator Danforth, had, as the Episcopal senator. I had been referred to as a Lutheran senator. We were trying to inject levity into something that could get tense. And my friend Howard Metzenbaum asked if I'd yield, and I said, I'll yield to now the senator from Benet Breath. He took offense, and I apologized. It was a mistake, but that's what we intended to do, and in the vein in which it was done. It wasn't a flip or nasty or smart aleck remark. It was intentional. I could have referred to him differently, and I think it may have offended him. I don't know, but that's my particular feel of it. He felt otherwise, and I apologized to him. But that didn't get any national disunity. I mean, what the heck? You don't live in a glass house, son. You've got a long way to go in this life. I can tell you well, right now, you'll hear a lot more insults and talks. These are not insults. These are misunderstandings come and to too tenuous a society. I, people are all uptight about their feel on different things. Well, pursuing that, then, what did you feel about Secretary Watt's remarks, and what is the difference? I thought they were out of order, but I thought it was a, a really poor uh, reflection on values that we have in Washington. There was Secretary Watt. He could desecrate the interior for three years and nothing set, but he desecrated the president's politics. Brother, he was gone. He was gone. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, oh, something just a little bit more general. Uh, you spoke about the change of the attitude of our, our government toward business that it now has an adversary role as distinct from the way Japan conducts this uh, uh, share of uh, helping business. And I was wondering, um, seems to me, and I don't know if you agree, that this is not only a government uh, problem, but the people in the United States are very uh, against big business. And, some, and perhaps the government is reflecting that, or at least our elected representatives are, and that something ought to be changed there. Do you feel that way? The people in general are, are terribly against big business. You see it in the newspapers all there, there, there is a mix and there's some justification. We saw the violations of big business in the intelligence field trying to take over governments overseas. 
We've just looked at the Lockheed case over in Japan, the bribes there. And uh, this is a whole new day. Now, you see, the world hadn't changed. We have, commendably so. When I first was elected, I've been in 17 years, you had Bobby Baker with hot and cold running government. You had the cash from the savings and loans and the velvet walls and the call girls and everything else. And you could get all the money you wanted to run for office and what have you. Well, there was a group of us that came at that time reflecting the feel out there, the fairness issue that the students brought in to the nation's capital relative to the war in Vietnam. That draft was not fair. And then we began to test, is the tax law fair? Is these environmental provisions fair? And it, then we brought it into government in the sunshine. And then we made a rule that every dollar I would receive as a candidate would have to be recorded, every dollar I expended. So we brought everything up to public basis. Then we got into the multinationals. And therein we found that, well, look at all the chemical waste dumps all over the country. No one paid any attention to it. And certainly the industries around, the people lived in these things and didn't think it would, you know, knew it wasn't right, but it wasn't hurting them as far as they know. Now we've got love canals all over the blooming place. And it's, it's a good move, but I find that generally speaking, our government and the administration of these various statutes, particularly with respect to international trade, was the point I was on, could be far more understanding and far more helpful. Uh, I'll give you one good example just, uh, as a specific. Uh, Ted Brophy, General Telephone and Electronics, went into competition, and this is some years back, in Korea on a communications contract, contacted the ambassador and said that we're going to be in competition here with the French. And <laughs> he went back a month later, and of course the French, they had 17 in the team that were working out of the embassy there. They were not only giving the parties, but really, you know, furnishing all the information on the contract and what have you. He went to our ambassador and said, what gives? We've been asking for help. We keep calling. We don't get an answer to our calls or anything else. He said, oh, I mentioned it to my counterpart. He said, well, in addition to mentioning it, we need it. He said that would be beyond the pale of diplomacy. Now, in contrast, Senator John Carl West as, as you were governor and he was ambassador at Saudi Arabia, he went in under the Carter administration as the ambassador of Saudi Arabia, and the first night he got together the embassy staff, consulate group, and he said, we are here at the volition of the American taxpayers, and we will assume that every business that comes over here is honest and competent, and until we find otherwise, we want to really turn over these facilities and help them because there's nothing out here and uh, we want to help them in every way we can. You know he was reported by the consular to Cy Vance who was Secretary of State. They investigated him for 10 months. They finally wrote him a letter and said it was all right. But uh, he hung in there. The staff and he as an ambassador did an outstanding job. They got literally billions and billions of dollars in contracts for American business which was American jobs which is what we're talking about, the economy. And not only that, he won the respect of the host country. Therein is a competitive atmosphere and environment in which we engage today. But America is just thinks it's one grand superpower. We've got the embargo mentality. We can embargo green. We can embargo pipelines. We don't, we're not living in the real world. You can't embargo anything and be effective in this dynamic. And I think our government's attitude should change. Yeah. Well, I, I wondered whether something should be done about changing people's attitudes. Well, let me just work on the government, and you work on the people out here. Uh -huh. We both have a job. Uh, yes, sir. Senator, I, your topics today, your, your speech today, dealt with the economy. <laughs> but this morning, an article of yours was published in the Boston Papers dealing with a position you took on Lebanon right. uh, in favor of pulling the troops out. And you said that the only thing that we're going to lose by pulling the troops out is a loss of face. And I'm wondering, isn't there m something more that will be lost if the American troops are being are pulled out? Not necessarily a loss of face. I'll have to look at that article. The fact is that I stated long ago, and this was last year when they went in, and during the debates, that if they were put there to fight, there were too few. And if they were put there to die, there were far too many. And there's no question but what we have missed 
or improperly described Lebanon. I noted George Will in an article this morning about Maggie Thatcher, and she was talking about both sides. They know both sides. There's seven sides at least in Lebanon. There are 12 Christian sects. There are four Muslim sects. The PLO split three ways and 50,000 Syrian troops, 30,000 Israeli troops. And to put 1,200 or 1,600 Marines at the end of a runway exposed as they are, and tell them to keep peace. They're not keeping any peace. They're not allowed to fight. You can't commit fit fighting men and say they're not going to fight. That's why I suggested, why don't you put 1,600 State Department striped pant bits out there? Let them. I'm sure they wouldn't fight. <laughs> and I think we'd get a quicker solution. But you've got America's best in uniform, and you're putting them there, and you don't let them go forward, you know, and they like to use these your catch phrases, cut and run. And last night on Crossfire, they started into that litany, and you had Pat Buchanan and Tom Braden and Senator Walden and myself. And I said, now, we all four have agreed we're going to cut. We're not going in. We're not going to do anything. In fact, the poor guard, when the pickup truck raced past him, he didn't have a clip in his rifle. wasn't allowed to. These have been political decisions and restrictions. And here it is. We all agree they should cut. They believe they should cut and squat. I happen to believe you should cut and run. Now, that's a crude way to put it. I don't believe in running. I said, in a judicious fashion, with your counterparts in the multinational force, work out a terminal date, say, by December the 1st or January the 1st of next year. But you cannot, and I do not advocate, embellishing or enlarging upon the Marine compliment there. And then you're going to get into some real trouble, unless you really want to go to war and take the country. And I don't think that's our policy. Bottom line, we do not have a mission. Right up to less than 24 hours ago, I was met with your Secretary of State and my Secretary of State, George Schultz. When my turn came, I said, Mr. Secretary, will you please, and I'm not being facetious, just say, this is the mission of that particular Marine detachment in Lebanon. He could not answer the question. The best he could come up after mumbling all around was the word presence. I mean, we have had Lebanon in civil war, and it's increasing in civil war nature. But we've had Lebanon in this particular posture for the last 10 years. We've had 58 ceasefires in the last 10 years. We don't need American troops for ceasefires and discord and trouble between the Druze and the Christians and those things of that kind. They, they, they will ensue. 1,200 Marines are not going to do anything about it. And the so-called have presence is a fundamental error of the Reagan foreign policy. They have no sense of mission. They cannot this minute tell you the mission. They have no sense of history. Anybody looking historically at this land would know you wouldn't be wandering around with gunboat diplomacy. They have an immediate reaction towards just that, the military or gunboat diplomacy, whether it be in Lebanon or down here in the Caribbean with respect to Nicaragua and El Salvador. And I think we're getting into dangerous circumstances, in my opinion, by just having a commitment made by Judge Clark and that National Security Group, and then when we come up and say, now, wait a minute, under the War Powers Resolution, Mr. President, just tell us in the Congress what is the mission and what would you consider to be success when it would have been accomplished so that then they can withdraw. I just give us not any dates and times or number of hours, but generally speaking, this is generally the mission, and when that is, has been accomplished, then they can withdraw. And uh, they haven't done that. And they've instead engaged in all kind of chicanery, saying we weren't in hostilities. Now, by gosh, they've got over 200 killed and not in hostilities. They were peacekeeping, and that's nonsense. There's no peacekeeping. They're in a war. It's not terrorism. Get that out of your mind. They're constantly reporting that. Whoever blew up that barracks is a frontline soldier and a war hero. Now, I don't know of what country. But that just wasn't a dissident group that met down in the coffee shop and decided to throw a Molotov cocktail into the barracks window. That thing was in, backed up by the best of intelligence, the right timing, right into the French, right into ours. They knew exactly when to hit, the path to take, the, the tonnage and everything else. And there was a, a, a very brave, you can call him a scoundrel and a thug and everything else like that. I can tell you we were in war, and if we could have had a chance to blow up that many Germans at a time, we'd had plenty in our outfit said, let me drive that truck. 
I mean, this is war, and this is a war front. We're shelling from offshore, we're bombing with French bombers, and it isn't just sitting around and we got a peaceful downtown Lebanon situation. Now, let's one final word since you've gotten on the subject about the Marines. The political decisions of what have hampered the Marines. If you go to any Marine commanding officer and say, now look at this right here at the end of the runway, oh no. He said, well, I'm not going to put my man out there exposed like that. So number one, to put them there is a political decision, not a Marine decision. Number two, to put that many, only 1,300, now they got it up to 1,600. They will tell you, any Marine commander, that in order to have a periphery to make it secure, I need 4,500 or a regiment. And they've told me that. And long before this occurred. So they didn't want to have too big a presence. You see, these are the political restrictions, almost like the trying to get the hostages out of Iran. You get a military decision and the politics comes in on top of it. These are White House decisions. Put them at the end of the runway, then have a smaller amount than what's really needed. And then the mode, the level of security, is also a political decision. Because we don't want to look too hostile. Don't let them have clips. Don't let them shoot at anybody. Don't let them do this. It's peace. We're peacekeeping. In order to fulfill the president's view of it on national TV, these are political restrictions that the president of the United States is responsible for. And I think he evaded and avoided the War Powers Resolution. He didn't want this Congress. He said, ah, oh, this resolution, <laughs> this paper means nothing. This doesn't restrict me. I don't need it. I'll sign it if they want to go along with what I'm doing. I'm putting my name here, but I don't. You'll find his attitude change. With 200 killed, he'll want us. He'll want us now. And I hope we can work together in some sensible way but get them out of there because it is really don't, it's, it's mission impossible. I don't believe in going up to the 4,500 men. I don't believe in putting them at the end of the runway. They're still going to be subjected to some kind of sniper fire and everything. You're in a downtown area with buildings and everything else. I remember when they jumped on the Israelis. Don't you remember when they were shelling a particular area and they said they were ruining the town? That was the only way to get security. It's war. It's not playing games. It's unfortunate. But we never were needed there before. We have vital interest in Lebanon. But there was one ground rule. You certainly weren't going to commit any American troops to that kind of situation. We got room. One more. Yes, sir. One last question. To yes. Get back, to get back to your earlier comments on the economy, I understood those comments as saying that you want to freeze the level of federal spending and reduce the deficit or eliminate the right. deficit, which right now is at substantially greater than what economists would call a full employment deficit. I was wondering how you're planning on doing that. Do you have any specific proposals for tax increases or tax reform? No, I would start with the freeze first. Every time you see, let's look at it. The record shows that earlier this summer we passed a requirement that we enact some $73 billion in additional taxes. I can't find a group of over five senators or host members that will agree on any $73 billion package. We passed it, but Bob Dole is struggling. If you look at the weekend magazines, he's struggling like the very devil to come up with 12. And I've been into these tax arguments before, and it sounds good, and this old adage of uh, Russell Long, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the fellow behind the tree. You know what I mean? And... Uh, no, you're not going to get new taxes. I'm trying to do just like Governor Como in New York. He froze his budget. Somebody said it was a partisan thing. Democratic governors have had to freeze spending and let employees go because they can't print money. They're trying to maintain the credit of the state of New York so they can carry on and do their borrowing and run the government. Governor Blanchard, Michigan, has frozen his budget and let some people go. This is a Democratic approach, Harry Truman balanced the budget four times, Lyndon Baines Johnson balanced the budget in 68, 69, the last time it was done. So this isn't a partisan thing. We were always able to be elected to office because we were responsible on the economy. For the past 10 years now, we've taken on the image of perception of tax and tax and spend and spend. I resent it. I know that I come from a wing of the Democratic Party that's been willing to pay the bills and still provide very strongly for social services. And I know 
that budget, and you can go into any phase of it, and I can tell you I can get way more money. We, a minute ago, I was telling I was going to get it out of defense. We passed for farmers without passing, excuse me, an executive order from the president last year said that we're going to adopt a pick payment in kind program, which in essence says sit on your duff and do nothing and send us what you say in your mind instead of planting, you're going to set aside. And with those set-asides and not be planted, that there would be the equivalent of X thousands or million bushels of wheat or whatever. And we will send you those bushels of wheat or allocate them in our green elevator. So that there is a nice, fine $15 billion program. Farmers can get $15 billion, and there's no fiscal irresponsibility, irresponsibility to it. We have a national defense problem, and we're right now appropriating $241 billion, and it's going next year over $300. We have a national education problem. We're only appropriating 15 and I want to increase that to 29 That's all we're saying. Thank you very much. I'm afraid uh, we're out of time right now, but I uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>